Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, first off, just want to let you know we had a few uh, technical difficulties. That's why you have handouts. But today is part of the Diversity Week celebration for Pathology Department. We are happy to have with us Mr. Everett Jordan. He is a senior executive for the Department of Defense at the Fort Meade, Maryland. He manages a diverse workforce of mathematics, mathematicians, sorry, computer scientists, engineers, language specialists, intelligence analysts, and network specialists. In addition to these duties, Mr. Jordan has held various leadership, administrative, and staff positions within the intelligence community. Throughout his career, Mr. Jordan has championed the development and use of new technologies, including speech recognition, machine translation, and relational database that incorporate, incorporate multiple human languages. So he's here today to speak to us on building a diverse and functional workforce. Welcome Mr. Everett Jordan. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first of all thank um, Luann for for inviting me here to, to speak to you today about um, diversity. This has been, this is something I always like to talk about. And um, I get the opportunity to do this here in front of you. This is the first hospital environment that I've been in. Um, I'm part of the intelligence community and we usually work in super secret dark places and um, <laughs> faces are obscured, even the person talking. And um, we, we try to have fun. And so hopefully this talk I'll be able to um, talk a little bit about what we do, how we do it, and draw some contrasts between what we do and also how you do it. You, hopefully you'll see some similarities. I'd also like to um, recognize Mr. Mark Nixon. He's with the, um, our Office of um, Equal Opportunity and Diversity at um, NSA. I'm an NSA employee, and so if you, you know, we, see, we say Department of Defense at Fort Meade, but that is the National Security Agency. I'm an employee of that organization, and I've been there for a long time. So um, I'll also get going. Um, although I'm a um, NSA employee, I work, I'm, I'm a regular office manager. I do not work in the Office of Equal Employment, Opportunity, and Diversity. So my job is not so much as an EEOD, EEO, we call EEOD officer. It is as a regular line manager in what we call operations. Um, I'm also involved as one of the senior advisors in our Islamic Cultural Employee Resource Group, which is one of the affinity groups that we have at our agency, and I'll talk, talk about that in a little bit later. Uh, my earliest professional training is in the field of languages, and which required that I study foreign languages and culture, as well as literature. Um, the idea of their you know, beliefs, practices, values, these are the things that um, help us understand what's going on in the world better. And a lot of that has to do with history. And in the medical field, history is very important. The same thing is true in our field of, of international relations. It's about the history of a country, the history of a peoples, what their geographic, geographic history is, what their economic history is, what their war history has been, who have their friends historically been. These are the things that influence their contemporary political thought, which leads them to say the things that they say and interact with our government the way they do. We need to understand that, not just as Americans here, but um, from the standpoint of the people coming, you know, wh where are they coming from? What are they coming to say to us? It is very important to get that in context, and so we take a lot. Um, we take a lot of steps to do that. And my field as a as a translator, I um I got to do that a lot. Um, the title of my discussion is um, building a diverse and functional workforce. And so I'll be describing building as the practice and a workforce as the outcome, as the functional outcome of that practice. And um, I see diverse work uh, working. Uh, excuse me. I see a diverse working environment as one that has people from many different, different places. The, um, the, the environment might contain people from any one of the following categories, um, race, color, um, religion, ethnic background, um, gender identity, um, gender. It may involve um, their educational background. It may involve um, socioeconomic status, as well as intellectual perspective. This is the diversity that we have. It's not just what you see on the surface that's about diversity. That doesn't always get it there. And, um, you know, diversity is something that's more than meets the eye. And if you're doing diversity right, it should be more than meets the eye. Yes, the eye must see it, but there has to be something below the surface that, um, that really goes into it. Um, to begin my discussion, um, I'll start by looking at the um, foundational guidance on diversity 
that we receive both here, um, both at the um, Department of Defense intelligence community, as well as some of the things I've been able to find out about Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, in a recent annual message to the workforce, the director of NSA, General Keith V. Alexander, expressed his personal commitment to diversity and inclusion. In that message, he emphasized the need for recruiting and retaining a world-class and diverse workforce. He outlined the position that each employee must take in order to um, foster a culture of diversity, exchange of ideas, ensure fair treatment of all, accommodate disabilities, resolve conflicts, and stay current through attendance at equal employment opportunity and diversity classes. He charged the workforce to see diversity as a mission imperative to be embraced by all. Um, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, in his remarks to the intelligence community, he said, our need to recruit and retain a high performing mission aligned workforce reflective of the diversity of our country and the world cannot be overstated. Our goal is to develop a workforce that can operate in a wide range of circumstances and situations and ready to take on an even wider range of challenges. The knowledge, perspectives, ideas, and experience of all employees are vital to the success of our global mission. The key to promoting diversity is leadership. As leaders, we are called to have more than a general endorsement of diversity efforts. Our commitment to a diverse workforce must be visible, specific, persistent, intentional, and personal. Every senior executive manager and supervisor should ensure that the workplace for which they are responsible runs on the principles of equity, fairness, and inclusion. Now, this is very important for us. We have a very diverse workforce. In my, in my bio, they talked about that I have the diversity of skill sets in my organization, and that is not quite common at, um, at our place. Sometimes we have, we, you know, we keep the engineers over there, and um, we have the intelligence analysts in this place, and the language folks, they're a weird bunch. Um, <laughs> we, we, we keep them in the back. Um, in my organization, we have them all working together um, because of the requirements today, it has them all collaborating on how shall we get this job done or that job done. And so for Johns Hopkins, I was doing, I was doing some research, and um, in your diversity and inclusion 2020 strategic plan, uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital states its overriding vision as no less than to be recognized by peer institutions, patients, and the community as a leading model for diversity and inclusion. To realize that division, specific goals in the areas of patients and community, the workplace, and the talent pool have to be addressed. In the area of patients and community, they want to address barriers to access and disparities in quality of care and outcomes at Johns Hopkins Medicine. By 2020, 75% of our community residents will view Johns Hopkins Medicine as a trusted partner. In the workplace, by 2020, 90% of employees perceive John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins Medicine leaders and employees across the organization as culturally competent, possessing the knowledge, attitudes, and skills to understand and respond effectively to the needs of diverse patients, trainees, and colleagues. For the talent pipeline, um, all levels of both medical and non-medical personnel will be representative in the, in the talent pool. And by 2020, 20% 20 of Johns Hopkins Medicine's top 100 medical and administrative leaders will be from underrepresented minorities. 20% of the next 200 Johns Hopkins Medicine's medical and administrative leaders will be from underrepresented minorities. This is part of the Johns Hopkins Hospital 2020 plan. This is something that they're working on, and I'm happy to see that. This is, all, this is also similar to our plan to make sure that we do have the representation. Often we will have some employees from the underrepresented groups ask, well, you know, they'll be working and they'll say, well, where, I don't see anyone that looks like me in the leadership. Why is that? They will ask that question. And that's a question that's a good question that needs to be answered. Why is that? Why aren't, why isn't the representation there? And so um, by contrast, for the DOD, um, the types of analytic perspectives on the world stage require input from a diverse and culturally competent workforce so that the most informed decisions can be made at the senior level by our law and, and policy makers. So we will, get, we will get questions from the White House. We will get questions from Congress. We will get questions from members of the cabinet asking about a certain thing that's happened in the world. And so we're not CNN and that we will just report the news. We have to give the background. Um, I talked about history before. We have to say this is what they said. This is why they're saying it. This is the, this is the perspective that they're coming from. And that helps influence you know, our decision making. And so we don't want to just give, make knee jerk reactions to something that goes on. It has to be well thought out. It has to be well reasoned, well argued. We may still make certain decisions based on our position um, in the United States 
as the United States government, nevertheless, we have considered well the, other, uh, the positions of others, um, what's going on, and what the implications may be um, for future international relationships or partnerships or things that, are, that may happen in the future. So building on that foundation, it's important to set up a work environment that will enable the group or team to flourish as a cohesive work unit. Sometimes this is easier to do with smaller groups than it is with larger ones, but with larger groups it's also possible. In order to um, get that going, you need to ask yourself a few questions. Um, what do I want to achieve by having diversity in this organization? Um, what's the outcome we're seeking here? What do we already have in the organization? From where are we planning to recruit for the future? How will we engage our current workforce to help us achieve those goals? As we address the question of what do we already have in the organization, um, this is how I understand the phrase that diversity is more than what you see comes into play. Um, most corporations have some form of organizational chart that they, um, that, they, that they use to describe who they are, what the subordinations are, and I'm going to ask my able assistant here to, um, to, to pass out um, the, the organization chart for you to take a look at. Um, just follow along while I, you know, while I describe what's in it. We'll, we'll, we'll take a moment um, for you to um, each have one. And the Defense Department is very, you know, it's one of those things, whenever you travel, you have to have an organization chart. I belong to this organization chart because I hate those things. Anyway, it, um, it lets people from all over the place know where you sit in the, in the food chain and um, how important your job is, how it, you know, who's your boss, and in the future, if they interact with your organization, um, what that means. So we have org charts, and perhaps you guys have organization charts here. And so I would like for you to take a look at this organization chart and consider an electrical wiring diagram. I put this chart together in a way that describes almost anyone's organization anywhere in the world. And so I've left names off of this for the sake of, um, of protecting the innocent and the guilty. <laughs> but um, so for the next couple minutes, just, just, just work with me here. Okay, at the top, you've got you've got the power source. Unless power is given to the circuit completely and continually, the circuit is not going to work well. Below that you have the alternate power source. It thinks it can do everything the power source can do, but it really can't. And nobody <laughs> told them it couldn't. Um, down you've got the fuses. These are, those, these are those components in the organization which carry the heaviest load, but they burn out real fast. <laughs> then you've got the rectifiers. They translate AC to DC. Then you've got the ROM. These are the people who've been in the organization a thousand years. <laughs> you can't fire them. They know where all the paperwork is, and they know where all the bodies are buried, and they will keep you out of jail. <laughs> then you've got the RAM. These are the newer people in the organization. They're trainable, they're malleable, they can do some of this, and they can do some of that. Very important. Then you've got the capacitors. They store up lots of information and only give off little bits at a time. Then you've got the diodes. They send information one direction, but not the other. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, we, I've got some. Then you've got your transistors, slightly older technology. They can still get the job done. They just need to be warmed up first. Um, then you've got your resistors. These components are built to do just one thing in life, and that's work against everything coming at them. Shut it down, slow it down, not allow it to happen. Then you've got your attenuators. They will, they will not allow change to happen. They will show, if they don't like it, they're shutting it down. Think of a volume control that just <laughs> turns it all the way down. Then you've got your vacuum tubes. No longer, no longer part of the main circuit, but they soak up a lot of energy and they give off a lot of heat. <laughs> well, I guess, this is my organization. I don't know what yours. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what yours is. Um, you also have your random charge. When everything else is working just fine, the random charge is floating around, and all it needs to do is just touch the side of your organization and throws everything into chaos. You may attach a name to that, a title to that. <laughs> But it is a random charge. Everything was working fine until he walked in and did this. Um, you've got those types in almost every organization. The key is recognizing the roles that those, that those components play. And you see that those, those components are at every level 
of the organization. And um, one of the things that I found that um, one of the downsides of this is these, these components can change polarity. Sometimes a fuse can be um, promoted to a power source. Do they continue to act like a fuse when they are the power source? Do they continue to only promote other fuses? You know, <laughs> you don't have to answer. I mean, it, you guys know each other, they're friends, you know, someone's taking notes, you know. Um, but being, you know, it's about diversity and understanding what your roles are, understanding what the roles of your people are. Now, the circuit needs each one of these components, but they need to be put in the right sequence in order to work. Understanding how they connect, understanding the importance of each and how it sits in an organization and not to expect something out of one component when their specialty is something else. This is, again, looking at what you have. This is the stuff that's below the surface when you um, consider a diverse workforce. They're from different places. They have different strengths. Let's take a look at those and put them in the right sequence and get them to work. The next thing I want to talk about are um, what I call the three C's. And um, it's another tool that we use when we measure um, either a brand, we want to put together a brand new team. You can put that down or just hold that, take that home, share it with family and friends. Um, the three C's, we, we take a look at that to assess what we have and also if we're trying to put it together an organization, what are you looking for? And um, I got this idea from a, um, one of my favorite inspirational writers, Bill Hybels. Um, he's the pastor of the Willow Creek Church in Chicago, and he writes in his book, Axiom, about a formula that he follows for choosing people how to be on his leadership team. I feel this formula has application in many areas regarding how to build a diverse team that's functional or assessing the functionality of the one that you've already got. Um, in the three C's, they stand for character, competence, and chemistry, the three C's. When a leader has the luxury of putting together a team of individuals to do a task, um, one of the first things that you look at among the applicants is the first C, character. What kind of person do I have here? What, is, what compass do they follow? Um, what, is their, what is their makeup? How do they handle things when things are going well? And, ha and are they a different person during times of adversity? Do they, do they switch on you? Do they, do they hulk out or something like that? And um, suddenly, have, well, they have one personality one day and then stuff starts to happen and they go a different direction. Um, they also want to know, you know, for character, you know, what are their values? And um, are they trustworthy? Um, are they honest to their own peril? Uh, sometimes we have people who sometimes don't, you know, they don't want to take blame or take responsibility for things that they've done. These are character issues, and so in looking at leaders as well as team members, consider character um, among the diversity that you've got there. It's not just what's on the surface, but what's beneath the surface. What kind of person do I have here? Um, the next is um, competence. Is the person good at their job? Are they so good at their job that that's the person you want to hire? That's the person that you want to bring into your, into your organization to work, that them being there will attract other good people to come in. You want to look at competence, um, not just somebody who's a pretty face or son of, brother of, daughter of, family member of. Um, you want to look at how good are they at what they do and um, how important is that to your organization. Of course, it's very important. You need competent people. Next is chemistry. How well do they get along with others? What, are they a team player as well as a good follower? Are they a leader? Can they, um, are they a screamer? Are they, are they um, someone who's hard to get along with, but they've been put in positions of leadership? Um, you consider character competence and chemistry. Some people would say, you know, he really gets the job done. I'm just looking at you because you're sitting there. Um, he, <laughs> he really gets the job done. But he's really hard, he's really rough on the people. And so we'll put him in charge of this organization. And um, some managers feel that I can deal with a leader, I, I can deal with a boss who's kind of rough on the people, and then we'll, do, we'll work on that over time, and then they can, um, you know, we'll, we'll still get the job done. Well, I found that that doesn't always work out well in the long run. In the short run, it may, if there's something that you need to get done by next week or next month, but in the long term, the people in the organization will self-select out. They will decide, I can't work with that person, I can't work for that person. Diversity might take a real hit if you've not taken, if you've not taken care of the character issue 
up front. That tends to wear on your organization. People will vote with their feet. The word will get out, and people may stop coming. Now, that's, you know, in some organizations, somebody needs to be there, and so um, perhaps in your experience, you've, you've worked with people or around people who have, um, who have been that, you know, <laughs> kind of hard to get along with person. Oh, yeah, one more question. I'm, um, I received a question earlier when I presented this org chart. Someone asked me, um, which one of those components are you? Yeah, and um, I said, well, depending on the date and the subject, I'm every one of those components. <laughs> I've been that guy. Um, and so it's not just about knowing everybody else around you, but knowing yourself too, you know, knowing who you are, the role that, that you play in the organization. And so um, the longer the dynamic of the, of, the, of, the, of the character is, you know, is still left in play and not, not done, not, uh, nothing is done about it, then the longer you're, you're going to have a problem with attracting diversity, maintaining diversity in an organization, maintaining the functionality of that team or that unit. Because um, these, these things, they, they, they come into play. Also, it's not just a, um, a formula for trying to put people together. We use this every day anyway. Um, this is how we look at each other without anybody ever asking us. Um, on occasion, I've had someone call, I've, a member of my organization is perhaps looking to move to another organization within the agency. And they use me as a reference. I get a call. And the person says, what can you tell me about her? And I will use, unknowingly, I will use the three C's to describe that person. I will sit there and say, she's reliable. She's, you know, very hardworking, somebody you can really count on. I'll say she's honest to her own peril. I'll say, the, uh, you know, she's a person who is happy to give credit to others, you know, for a job well done. And if something has gone wrong, she will stand up and take, you know, that she, you know, works well with the team. Um, excellent at her job. She, you know, she's gotten these accolades for having done this, having achieved that, having done. I seldom go, I seldom you, uh, talk about somebody in the context of, well, they showed up to work on time every day. Or they, um, I needed six reports done by, by Friday and they got six reports done by Friday each week. I don't go, I don't go into their stats. I talk about them as a regular person. It's, and it, it always comes out as the three C's. We do this normally. When we go home and talk about the people that we work with, it doesn't happen here, but when we go home and talk about the people that we work with, um, we're still thinking about the three C's. And um, it's, so when I saw it in his book, it just made great sense. If you're gonna to put together an organization, uh, consider that. The organization that you're in, take a look around. Get to know the people for the roles that they play, but also the, all the stuff that's below the surface. That is as important to diversity as is what's on the surface. You know, the color of skin, nationality, origin. Um, and you know, it doesn't. You know, those are things that also, that you also have to keep in mind. As far as um, recruiting and competing for talent, um, how many people here have actually been on recruiting trips? Those of you who have, those of you who have had to try to plan recruiting trips, it's tough. Um, I've been, I've gotten to, to go on recruiting trips for our agency many times, and it's, it's always tough out there because everyone is competing for the same talent pool, the same um, diversity, the same groups of minorities, the same representational groups. The competition is out there and it's coming from everyone. And so what I see um, from, you know, our, you know, both of our fields are very similar in that regard, and so we have to understand um, what the prospective employees are looking for when we, when we go and talk to them. Um, one thing that's always in short supply for us, um, because we're the U.S. government, is money. Um, I used to say money is no object. We don't have any. Um, <laughs> but, so, so you figure out a way around that. Um, <laughs> look at the pretty birds. Um, but the, the person who said that you could never get rich working for the government probably worked for the government for a little while. And, um, but what we do is we look at what we are about. We try to describe the things that we are about. And so money is not the biggest draw for the people who work in our agency. It's about a lot of other things. It's the broad range, it's the broad range of assignments, of research projects, um, support for additional education to enhance the skills that you already have. We, you know, we, we, we do support going back to college to get even higher degree with what you have because our folks need to be at the cutting edge of things and it's an investment for us. Um, 
In other cases, it's about making an appeal for them to travel, if they'd like to travel, to go to places in the world they've never been. And we bring that out. We also talk about members of our employee workforce who, have, who, who hold patents um, for processes and, um, new, and new gadgets or whatever. Uh, many, many of our folks have them, um, not me, but um, really good. There's a, there's a young lady that we know, she's a math intern, she's a PhD math intern, and she um, just got her first patent. She's been working at the agency for about a year and a half. Um, I'm just jealous. And <laughs> I've been there 36 years and they're not even looking at me for any kind of patent. But um, that happens, that's normal, that's part of our brand. And so you have to consider what your brand is. What, what do you want your brand to say to people who are interested in coming to work here? You want to talk about diversity. If diversity exists, talk about it. You want to um, talk about the things that, that, that you bring up so that um, someone who comes here can see not just what they might want to do, but perhaps there are other avenues. In some cases, our, you know, our agency allows us to take on many different skills. Um, our agency does not hire managers. And we hired um, technicians, um, specialists. And so I was hired as a language guy. And I um, got to do that for a while. And so now I'm one of the senior managers. Um, several of my friends who were hired as translators um, went, went to law school and came back. And they now work on our general counsel as lawyers. This is, this is kind of cool. Um, if you have those things about your organization, you know, promote those things, especially when money is no object. Um, if you do have money, talk about that too. Um, <laughs> It's, you know, it's, there are a lot of things that makes you number one. And Johns Hopkins knows what those things are and they practice them regularly. Good name recognition, good brand. Um, it is up to everyone in this room to maintain that and make sure that the diversity aspect of it is there that is reflective of society, reflective of the work, workforce, and reflective of your, of, of your customer set, you know, your patients. On the subject of technology, I'm only going to talk briefly about that. I could go on all day, but um, in both our agency and in the healthcare field, um, technology is always changing. It's always evolving, and so trying to stay up on the latest and greatest for everything in the world is um, is very important. And in, as I talked in my bio, it, I've worked with machine translation and other tools um, to help improve our our capabilities. And I've um, worked with a lot of people who have um, seen way too much Star Trek. <laughs> I don't know who they are, <laughs> um, but they assume that you can create a machine that speaks comfortably and capably in clear idiomatic English from any, from any country, any dialect in the known universe, um, and without flaws. Uh, they're called people, and um, the tools that we use are there to assist the people to, um, to, do, to, um, to do what they need to do. And in many cases, we use um, those, kinds of, those kinds of technologies to help us do a lot of triage for large data sets that need to be gone through. Um, they help the humans work faster and more efficient on the things that only humans can do. And so about technology, I say that technology will not replace humans, but you know, the employees who know how to use the technology will replace employees who don't. And that's about the, that's about the main thing <laughs> I'll say about that. Um, as far as affinity groups goes, um, both our organizations are firm believers of having um, affinity groups, employee representational groups, um, that um, they have similar, people who have similar, ah, my English is not good, similar cultural backgrounds, um, good history, uh, same history, interests, and social identifications that are beneficial to how, that they can contribute to how the um, organization works. And so um, there are four groups at Johns Hopkins Hospital that I'm aware of, and if there are more, by all means, um, do, um, Correct me here. Um, the network is one that I find very interesting. Um, the network of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender employees and supporters that seeks to create a welcoming and affirming environment for LGBT, LGBT employees, patients, and family. Um, there's OLA, the um, Hopkins Organization for Latino Awareness, that seeks to improve the quality of and access to care for Latinos seeking health care at Johns Hopkins through scholarship, education, and policy leadership. There's the Veterans for Hopkins, um, a group that seeks to create a welcoming, affirming, and network environment for veteran employees. And there's SHAPE 2020, um, strengthening Hopkins Asian and Pacific Islanders employees for 2020. These are excellent groups. They need to be in place. They need to do the things that they can do. 
and I encourage their growth plus the, um, the addition to more as people decide they perhaps need to be. Um, Johns Hopkins already supports these, and so seeing more come should not be an added burden if you see the necessity. At NSA, um, by contrast, we have nine employee resource groups. They're called, we call them ERGs for short, um, and they informally represent a particular cross-section of our workforce. Um, the programs are a key element of our agency's diversity strategy. Uh, members have the opportunity to raise awareness and engage their fellow employees, including agency senior leadership, to shape policy and practice. They also serve as a forum for addressing barriers and promoting fairness, inclusion, respect, and equality for all employees. At our agency, we have the Veterans Group. We have a Women's Employee Resource, um, resource Group. We have Asian American Pacific Islander Group. We have the Islamic Cultural Employees Resource Group. We have Persons with Disabilities Resource Group. We have African American Resource Group. The Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgender, and Affiliates Resource Group. We have the Hispanic Latino Resource Group and American Indian Alaskan Native. This is, um, these are very, um, very involved groups and they continue to grow. One of the good things about, um, interesting things about these groups is you don't need to be a member of that particular group uh, by design to, uh, one more time, you don't have to be, you don't, don't have to identify as, as a member of the group to be a member of the group. Um, I'm, the, I'm, the senior, um, I'm one of the senior advocates for our Islamic cultural group and I'm Christian. Um, so I'm not kept from being a part of the group. We have a lot of, a lot of men who are part of the um, women's employee resource group because um, some of them are leaders and others and some are just trying to figure out what are women talking about. And um, <laughs> guys, do everything you can, you know. <laughs> I'm with you, yeah. <laughs> There's no shame in it. Anyway, <laughs> um, we, you, don't you don't have to be a woman to be part of the women's ERG. Um, for our African American um, group, we have um, several advisors who are Caucasian. This is not about just the identification, it is about the participation. It is about learning diversity as an, as a, um, from the regular employee up to the senior advisor. We all get a chance to contribute. And so a lot of our groups do a lot of things during the course of a year to make sure that the, um, the agency is aware of what we do, that the workforce learns a lot about um, what we're involved in. And so um, I'd like to describe some of our ERGs, um, what they've done in the past year to enhance diversity, awareness, and inclusion in the workplace. Um, the following activities I'm going to talk about all took place in 2012. Um, last year, the American Veterans ERG members researched veteran preference issues, including enhanced annual leave policies and how to buy back military time, and provided the information to the HR personnel to update records. The Asian American Pacific Islander Group hosted a presentation on the historical perspective of Asian contributions to cryptology. Last year, for the October Disability Awareness Month, Section 508 compliance issues were discussed and training was hosted by persons with disabilities to explain NSA's responsibilities and to showcase enterprise capacity. Transportation issues, specifically the shuttle services, parking lot safety, and parking enforcements were discussed and recommend recommendations for changes were made. On the um, side of um, language and cultural diversity, our expertise in language and cultural understanding come into play as we respond to the president's requirement for timely um, and accurate information in order to understand and address various international events. I started out on this business about 36 years ago. Yeah, I rode my bike from the third grade to the <laughs> fourth grade. And um, my job was to translate Russian into English. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in Russian, and I have a master's degree in theology. And um, I've also gotten the, the opportunity to study um, Spanish, French, Arabic, German, and Hebrew um, along the course of my career. And I've gotten a chance to use those languages. And they actually um, paid me to learn them. I'm, I'm, I'm a language geek like that, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm with my own back at the agency, so I'm good. Um, nevertheless, that's, that's the diversity that we have here. So anyways, I started out as a language person, and I um, got to learn a lot of things. And the requirements that I had to follow in order to do my job well 
over the years, those requirements have not gotten any easier, you know, for, for content, for a variety of things I've had to be able to do, as well as the, um, basically the frequency of things coming at us. Now, in order to do language work, it involves quite, a, um, actually every job here requir requires quite a bit of technical competence. I talked about competence, one of the three C's. And so we will test everyone with, um, with all types of skills. In the language field, it is no difference. You will be tested. And so um, you can't just have technical competence to understand a foreign language, but you have to have the, cul the cultural competence as well um, so that our assessments can be made in the proper context by people who were either raised in those countries or spent a great deal of time there. We take these things very, very seriously. Um, these skills are absolutely critical to our mission. Um, in their article called The Case for Diversity in the Healthcare Workforce, um, Jordan Cohen, Barbara Gabriel, and Charles Terrell, they describe this much better than I do. They talk about the critical need for a culturally competent workforce. For them, the term cultural competence denotes the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors required for a practitioner to provide optimal health care uh, opt optimal healthcare services to persons from a wide range of cultural and eth ethnic backgrounds. Given the rapidly changing U.S. demography, it is axiomatic that the majority of future healthcare professionals will be called upon to care for many patients with backgrounds far different from their own. To do so effectively, healthcare providers must have a firm understanding of how and why different belief systems, cultural biases, ethnic origins, family structures, and a host of other culturally determined factors influence the manage in which these people experience um, health care um, and also influences the ways that they um, experience illness and how they adhere to medical advice, how they um, respond to treatment. Um, such differences are real and they translate into real differences in the outcome of care. Furthermore, physicians and other healthcare professionals who are unmindful of potential impact of language barriers, various religious taboos, unconventional explanatory models of diseases, or traditional alternative remedies are not only unlikely to satisfy their patients, but more importantly are also unlikely to provide their patients with optimally effective care. I recently asked a family friend of mine um, who has been in the healthcare field in Washington, D.C. for about 30 years, I asked her to share some of her thoughts on the cultural and language issues described above, and she told me that a, majority, that a major challenge to diversity in a hospital environment is understanding people with very heavy accents. She says this is a problem for patients who may have a nurse from another country that they don't understand or for a nurse taking medication orders from a doctor that he or she may have a hard time understanding. Also cultural diversity is very, um, is very, is it, ah. cultural diversity, and uh, one more time, <laughs> cultural diversity is very important to um, understand how people manage pain. And you know, sometimes what qualifies as humor in one language does not translate well into another. <laughs> Understanding and honoring the, difference need, the different needs of different people, such as Muslim women not having a male nurse, are part of caring for patients. Most hospitals require education related to diversity and dealing with language barriers. For instance, there are requirements and processes for how to interact with people who are deaf. Um, she also mentioned that in the um, what you guys call the PACU, uh, post-anesthesia care unit, patients who are going home after surgery need discharge instructions. If there's a language barrier, for instance, the nurse speaks English and the patient speaks Persian Farsi, uh, the nurse has access to language line. Actually, I know the guy who created language line. If you, if you guys still, um, Jeff Monks, cool guy. Anyway, um, they have access to language line over the phone, whereby they call up a, an interpreter who's on call 24 hours a day. Um, they say what they need to say in the interpreter and it's um, very um, specialized, will provide the response um, over the phone. This is, a, this is a good use of uh, people with skills everywhere. They don't have to be right there on the spot. And so she uses um, language line. This is also in hospital staff who are fluent in another language are often trained to be interpreters. Utilizing family members is not okay. And I believe that to be true here. You can give me the head nod on that. Um, I've, um, many of my friends in the field have told me too many horror stories, and I think you guys have some horror stories too, that um, where this is never a good idea to have family members to tra um, translation or interpretation. Um, healthcare professionals cannot become culturally competent solely by reading textbooks and listening to lectures. Um, they must be educated in the environments um, that are emblematic of the diverse society they will be called upon to serve. Um, in our agency, we put a lot of emphasis on our educated language capability. 
We're all native speakers of something. This does not make us experts in anything. Just saying. Um, this includes translation and interpretation. Um, unless we have more, you know, unless you have more formal training in a field, um, you shouldn't consider yourself an expert at it. Um, a colleague of mine from the Defense Language Institute in California once shared a quote with me. He said, if everybody who speaks a foreign language would be an interpreter, then everyone with teeth would be a dentist. <laughs> and so please do not assume that you are a professional interpreter. If <laughs> I took Spanish in high school. Um, I walked past a room where French was being taught. You know, I stayed at a Holiday Inn last night. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> had a girlfriend once and she spoke French. You know, it's <laughs> not quality. We will test you. We will test everyone for their skills. Um, in this field, there, there, are some, um, there are some fun things to, that, we, that we look at. Even our um, native, you know, people with native skills, native capable skills, we test them as well. Again, the expectation is that you have the specialized knowledge and vocabulary and understanding of the concepts in order to make sure that the person who needs to understand it, understands it. And, the, um, and that you understand also what they are trying to say so that the patient is cared for. Um, that happens to us a lot in our field. Um, we have to, one of the things we have to learn about is the difference between dynamic equivalence and formal correspondence. This will all make sense in a minute. How many of you know what I'm talking about anyway? Dynamic equivalence and formal correspondence? Anyone? Okay, great. <laughs> great. Dynamic equivalence. A young translator is working on an article in a, in a newspaper and, and is talking, it's talking about a diplomat who's talking to his friends and he says, oh boy, this is a really hard, this is a really hard situation here, um, but I fear that when I return home I'm going to be, um, I'm going to end up between the sword and the wall. Entre la espada y la pared. Between the sword and the wall. And um, so the translator translates that literally and says, uh oh, this guy's probably going to be in trouble when he gets home. And so he shares that with his senior translator, and his senior translator says, you've made a mistake. You have to understand that in Spanish, when you say you're between the sword and the wall, in English you are saying, I'm between a rock and a hard place. In Russian, the phrase is between a hammer and an anvil. Um, <laughs> everybody's got that phrase. Um, <laughs> and it's culturally, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 you know, we would say that's the last straw in English. In Spanish, it would be the last drop of water that overfilled the cup. And so it's, it's a matter of understanding. Um, that is dynamic equivalence. When you don't translate something literally, you have to understand what they're getting at. Um, my favorite is in Arabic, when they um, talked about the guy, they're, they're explaining something about a certain patient and having met the, having met the parents, and the phrase comes out, I can't really say it well in Arabic, but it translates, the son of a duck is a floater. <laughs> and um, literally, it, the, the son of a duck is a floater, but um, figuratively it means like father, like son. And so, <laughs> the, you gotta know this stuff, it's, it, it's great. Um, I asked some colleagues who do medical interpretation um, to provide me with some of the positive stories where an, interpretation, an interpreter's knowledge of language and culture helped contribute to a positive outcome for the patient. And so a colleague of mine um, directed me towards um, um, Bobby Darren, not the singer. Um, um, she has a person with a law degree as well as um, she runs a small translation company and um, she does medical interpretation. And so in one of her um, stories, um, I'm going to um, read this. It's, um, let's take a moment. It says, it was a typical Saturday night on labor and delivery when my pager went off again. And as usual, I was the only Spanish interpreter in the hospital. I was just on my way out the door after assisting with our second delivery of the evening when hashtag 6644 started flashing. It was radiology. Can you come right away to CT, pleaded the female voice on the other end of the line. We have an order from ER, STAT, but we need, the, we need to double check something. It was Gina, a second tech, a seasoned tech. There was an uncustomary urgency to her voice. When I pushed open the double doors of the half-lit room, I spotted the patient a thin, attractive Latino in his mid-40s lying prone in the go position, ready to enter the scanner. The intravenous tubing in his left arm was connected to a giant pump poised overhead, primed to dispense the contrast dye through his veins. I followed his anxious gaze towards the protective wall at the corner of the room where Gina and a burly male tech I didn't recognize were in a heated discussion. 
It wouldn't take long to figure out why uh, that I'd been called. Apparently, the tech had just transported the patient from the ER and was ready to start the scan when Gina arrived and asked if he had paged the interpreter. That's when the fireworks started. Rather than call me per hospital policy, he followed the advice of the bilingual ER nurse. She told the tech the doctor was in a big hurry and that time shouldn't be wasted calling the interpreter when she was perfectly able, of, um, able of, um, to interpret. The tech glowered at me, directing his comment at Gina. I already told you the nurse said he's good to go. Ignoring him, Gina turned and mentioned me towards the patient, motioned me towards the patient, saying, it'll just take a minute, I want to recheck his history. I introduced myself to the patient, and Gina and I began to quickly run through um, a dozen or so questions. We sailed through the first few until we got to what would be the crucial question. Do you have any allergies to medications, Gina asked. Yes, but just to a medicine from my country, for diarrhea. My heart started beating faster. From his accent, um, manner of speaking, and appearance, I recognized the patient was likely from El Salvador. And I had a good idea what the medication might be. And before the tech had a chance to move on to the next question, I asked a question to clarify. What's the name of it? I asked. He says, Yodoclorina, he said. The male tech quickly interjected, yeah, I heard that already. He told that to the nurse. He said it was just something for diarrhea. She said it's no big deal. It's iodine chlorine, I said. My fears confirmed. Gina looked shocked. She asked the patient, what happens when you take it? Oh, well, it makes me really sick. I puke all over the place, he answered emphatically. And then as an afterthought, he says, oh, and I get short of breath, too. The doctor told me never to take it again. Unfortunately, the bilingual ER nurse didn't know yodo was iodine the chief active ingredient of the contrast dye that was primed in the pump, ready to be injected in the patient's veins. Had the male tech proceeded, it is very possible the patient would have suffered a fatal anaphylactic reaction to the iodine. Um, again, training. We don't, we don't just put anybody <laughs> in there because they know a very, very um, stringent testing needs to happen in all fields. Um, so having, let's say we've put together a, um, a diverse workforce. We've considered the, the three C's. We've considered the org chart. We've considered our own feeling on how we, uh, how we work with people, our experience when you interview someone, what they know, what they don't know, and if you can use them in your organization. How will you, how will you know that you've achieved it, that you are at a diverse, functional workforce? Um, you might know it. Actually, you might not know it, at least not right away. Um, your team will be in place tackling the day-to-day -day with the usual craziness that takes place. Uh, one of the ways you might tell will be how you assess how you're spending the majority of your day. Are you spending the majority of your day working on personnel issues? Trying to solve problems and disputes among the people that you work with? Or are you, are you taking care of business? Are you seeing patients? Are you getting the job done? Are you at the meetings that you need to be at? Um, you also may notice that you're not spending um, time doing excessive personnel counseling because nothing has come up, not just because you're ignoring the personnel stuff. And, um, <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> the diversity on your team has come in handy in the problem solving area and you realize that you never would have gotten there without that particular mix. The role players are playing their roles, the leaders are leading, the workforce is supporting, and the patients see your organization in a different light. If the mix is working well, then the word may get out and more people will be attracted to your organization. Um, my experience with this is that it doesn't always remain static. Um, when those days, weeks, months, and even years were all in sync, both for the diversity of the org chart and the three C's that I talked about, it's more normal than not to look back at that time when you were in that place or worked with those people, when everything seemed to work out well. Everyone understood the vision. Everyone supported that vision. They worked together to make the vision work and to, to get along and to get the job done. Um, in some cases, it, it took time for the relationships to gel, but in other cases, everyone seemed to click almost right away. Um, there may have even been some external unpleasantness going on, but by and large, the team, the office, the group, and the unit all worked well together, both on and beneath the surface. Um, when those things happen, you have or have had a diverse functional team. This is not, um, you know, I'll get into, uh, the downside to all of this happens is when um, pr um, someone leaves the team, leaves the unit, leaves the office, the dynamic changes. Even if no one comes in for a while, um, the dynamic is still changed. And you have to consider that working, you know, keeping, maintaining that kind of level, um, is, it takes deliberate action. 
You can't just sit back and say, okay, I've succeeded, I, you know, it's all done, and declare success and say that's it. And it stays that way for the next five to 10 years and you don't see things going really, really wrong. Um, so I've learned that um, building, maintaining, and reconstituting a diverse and functional workforce takes that attentive work. Um, so once you have the group together, don't just sit back and believe the job of diversity is done. Also, I would suggest that a one of each approach does not work. Let's see, I have my African American, I have my Asian, I have my Latino. Um, okay, he's married to a Latino woman, so that counts. Um, I, you know, that does not, I don't recommend that. That, again, it does not work. Um, a one, it's, it's a one size fits all solution. This is not a one size fits all challenge. And so you really shouldn't look at a one size fits all solution. You should not have just one of each in an organization and say, okay, it's diverse. It might be one person of a diverse background in there, and that's the right mix for that organization. It will be the determination of the leadership, of the people involved, the entire team, um, how this is working. You have to constantly assess and um, take all those things into account. Um, a cookie cutter approach to exact numbers of representation in each office does not work. It hasn't worked for me. Um, as I mentioned before, diversity is more than what you can see. And actually, that particular phrase comes from the Johns Hopkins website on diversity. Diversity is more than what you can see. And I wholeheartedly support that. Um, it's about inclusion, it's participation, it's contribution, and it's cooperation. As far as leadership and participation um, are concerned, um, those are critical at all stages of a diverse and functional workforce, from recruitment to placement to mentoring to advocacy to promotion and to retirement. Leadership must be present at every phase. Um, throughout the course of a leader's career, this will be at times easy and at times hard. If new policies need to be upgraded, upgrade them. If old policies need to be done away with, do away with them. If um, something needs to be changed to be made more contemporary, then go ahead and do that. Um, you don't have to do it by yourself. You have your affinity groups, your employee resource groups. Working with them will help you guide how those things change to make them more inclusive. This is, this is why we are here. This is where we get to really see diversity in action. It's not just waiting for the person in charge to make all of these great and wonderful decisions. They do need the input. Um, you need the input because we're all from somewhere. We all have one set of background and variables. We need the input from everyone else, and that's when, the, that's when it really starts to work. Um, anyway, hopefully I've, um, over these last several minutes, I've been able to share with you um, my ideas, thoughts on, on diversity and uh, the things that have worked out well, things that have not worked out so well. Um, in doing research for this talk, I also gained a clearer understanding of what Johns Hopkins Hospital does, um, what you all do, and a chance to see how it is um, similar to what happens in my organization. And so um, before I finish, I would like to ask Lou Ann to come up for a second. Um, another fun thing that I do as a manager is I, I make a public spectacle of my employees. Um, <laughs> works for me. Anyway. In the Department of Defense, we have these things called challenge coins, that when someone has really gone out of their way to do a good thing for your organization or for you or you think they're just a wonderful person, you give them an organizational challenge coin. And so it has your organization on one side and your agency's name on the back. And um, the correct way to do it is, is to put it in the hand and shake hands. And I hand it to you <laughs> that way. And thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk to you today. And so. With that, this closes my remarks and I open it up for, for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? I think it's very interesting that in your org chart that what you describe were sometimes employees that are not so desirable. However, mm -hmm. they are under certain contexts that you need that type of counsel. It's very interesting. The circuit needs point. all of these components to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's interesting that you point that out because some people might say they're, you know, they're not. <laughs> We're all people. In some, places, in some organizations we have worked. Things have been great. In other organizations where we have worked, things may not have been all that great. The mix may not have been right. And we might not have been considered the great achiever in this organization that we were <laughs> in that organization. And so it's interesting that you point that out. But yes, the circuit needs everybody. It needs all types. What else? What yes. do you think was the most successful tool in your experience to attract a diverse workforce? 
making sure that we had a diverse recruiting staff, um, make sure that our leadership team reflected the, um, the membership of the organization. And so in some cases, uh, culturally, we would try, if we we're going out to colleges and universities, we try to send young folks out because they don't want old gray beards like me walking in. And, um, <laughs> but in, uh, in, in, in the Oriental culture, we, uh, we realized that it is not the young people who, who carry the, the weight there. You need to send your most senior employee from that community out. And that's the person that, ha that has the gravitas. And so we would send our most senior person there. And some, in other places, we, and when we do recruiting, we would go and eat. Um, this is hungry work. But we would go out <laughs> and um, if there was a cultural community festival, we would attend that festival. We would sit down and eat um, and just have a casual conversation up front, not talk business, get to know people. <laughs> you know, let them get to know who you are, who you represent. It's a very human thing, works all over the world. And um, those are some of the ways that, uh, in my organization has an international food festival um, on Thursday of this week where we have foods from all around the world. Uh, my organization, they, we, we deal in 19 foreign languages and so, we have, so we, our people look at countries all over the world and so they're bringing in ethnic food from their regions and so we do that and we dress up and things. Um, but we try to reflect um, both in a, in a daily practice um, the diversity of the organization um, locally as well as in a, in a much grander scale. Yes. In your organization, um, how do you measure and have reached your um, goal as far as diversity is concerned? I mean, um, like here, we have the Pathology uh, Diversity Committee, and every so often we, you know, we ask ourselves, have we ever achieved our goal as far as diversity is concerned? Um, we count. Um, <laughs> 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 That's a short answer. Um, we <laughs> take a look around and see what, what representation we do have of the, of the, of the major, um, and there are about five major groups of diversity that we look for. Um, women, Hispanic, African American, you know, we look at that. Um, and we also, and we stand alongside the other members of the Defense Department and the Intelligence Community and compare ourselves with the other agencies. How are they doing with the um, expectation of representation? And for in some cases, 33% is what we're, you know, we're trying to achieve, we almost don't achieve that. Um, in some cases we're doing well compared alongside our brother and sister, but in another case we're not doing as well as we'd like. And so we have to constantly get out there and compete for um, <coughs> folks uh, uh, from different areas because they're being competed for, they're being lobbied and recruited by companies that can pay more, can offer more of what they're looking for. In some cases it has to do with geography. We'll go to the West Coast, and we find that people from the West Coast usually don't want to come all the way out to the East Coast to work. They want to work locally. Um, and so us recruiting west of the Mississippi is a bit tougher than recruiting east from the Mississippi. And so we try to you know, keep those things, factors in mind that people don't want to work too far from where they grew up. Me, I'm from Southern California. Um, but I was young. I needed the money. So I guess <laughs> I was in the army, and um, my dad always said, "Take the job, see family when you can." And so, <laughs> so that's what I did. Um, but yeah, it's, it's how you, how you know what you've got, um, how you know how close you are. We we count, and we have um, certain goals that we are trying to achieve. And every year, it's it, it gets tough to not just recruit and and hire on, but to maintain, to retain them, to keep them from being hired off um, by somebody else. Yes. So within, so within in, within individual diversity group, like for example, Muslim group or Asian group, mm -hmm. how do they know that they are diverse in their group themselves? If everyone is Asian, everyone is uh, Muslim, so um, they look around, <laughs> um, and uh, there are in in the Muslim group where I am, there are many there are many non-Muslims, and also the numbers don't. And we have Muslims who are veterans, and so they're part of the veterans group. Um, we have um, veterans who have friends in the LGBTA community, so they're part of that group as well. And so we do a lot of mixing around a lot, but it's very important to have um, not just remember from your own, uh, not just people from your own affinity group by how they look, but also people who come in, who show an interest, who show support. And so the learning really happens a lot. Diversity takes place. People learn a lot of things, and um, 
one of the toughest parts has to do with promotion, you know, getting people into the higher ranks. And that takes time, and it also takes um, diligence on the part of the employee, as well as the managers, the leadership that wants to raise them up. Because sometimes getting higher in the, in the, in the organization means that you may have to give up certain monetary compensation for a skill set that you do at this level. And so that's a, that's a, that's a trade-off there. It's a very long question, but uh, it's very important. How successful can your organization, your organization is trying to be when you remove the component and you don't replace that component for whatever reason, financial? Does it still work? You will be the only one who can, who can make that determination locally. Are we still meeting our goals? Are we still meeting our goals for diversity? Are we still meeting our goals for the job that we're required to do? Are we still getting it done? Um, in some cases, we have to do a lot of cutbacks in the government that you may have heard about. Uh, how do we do this job with fewer people? Um, and then when the diversity starts to leave, how do we do it with fewer people and still try to maintain a diverse workforce? Uh, those challenges are day to day. Um, Hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, another, another question. Yeah, I'm back to uh, Willie Farrar. He, he had mentioned um, how do we measure that we're doing the right thing. And, um, I know that the diversity committee has been in function for quite some time in pathology, mm -hmm. and we've often, uh, the question has come up, you know, how do we measure that we, the committee, are doing the right thing? And are we going down the right pathway, and are we affecting change in people? So. Uh, I'm trying to put this all together and think, well, maybe we think of some goals and we think of the three C's and somewhere in there might be some measurable thing that would help guide that we're picking the right things. Like today's, you're being here, mm -hmm. a, a very good thing. I think it's a very right thing. But, you know, how do we measure that your presence has affected change for us? And I don't know how to do that. It, Okay, here's, 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 a, here's a warning to you. You weren't the only one in this room that heard this. And so you might get applications for, we need to have this kind of ERG. We need to have that kind of affinity group. Or maybe we want to do this. And that's where the you know, seeds, the well, best I can do here is plant some seeds. And then see, see how they take hold, see how they are translated to the folks here and what they might want to do with them. Um, and discussions that you're going to have subsequent to this meeting. That may be one way to gauge are we, are we getting close to the mark? Are we being responsive? Yeah, and then ask, ask the question um, <laughs> to the workforce. Uh, I think I can take one more. One more. I was just add, add, add to the answer there a little yes. bit, if I could. Sure. Um, just one, one way of looking at that, you know, as, as you said, you know, how, how do we know where we're at? And when we do count, we're the government. You know, we, we, we count, that's how, that's how we, we function. But one of the other things, too, is looking back at your solutions, one of the, our director's sayings, or one of our power sources' sayings, is, is um, you know, our best intelligence solutions are born out of diversity. So are we getting our best intelligence solution in our case? In your case, I'm sure it would be your best medical solution, right? Are you, are, are you where you want to be? Are you, are you taking into consideration the other side of the equation? to the fullest that you can. And is you know, that do you know your patients as, as well as, as, as you need to know their, their culture? So that would be taken into consideration all the underlying things that you don't see yes. necessarily in the face of it. Yes. Because right. That's really so, so, you, so you have two parts. You have the part you can easily measure, right. but you have the other part that, that's a little harder to measure. And are you where you want to be uh, with, with, your, with your product, with your solutions, with your medical care? Thank you, everyone. I just know something we have to get back, so I just wanted to. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Jordan would still be here if you have a couple questions afterwards. Thanks, everyone, for coming. If you didn't sign in, they're uh, around the corner. There's also the new education, and hopefully, we, I'm sure you planted some seeds for us to think about a very enjoyable talk. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you all.